Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. And, um, you know, we all kind of want to feel unique and that uh, we're special and the only ones just like ourselves in the world. So it can be kind of strange running into people sometimes who are very much like us or look like us or even have our names, our last names, who aren't obviously relatives and stuff or, or who may be doing some of the same kinds of things that we do. And so I've got a bit of a surprise. Now, I know that I can Google and see my name, Dave or Dave Lefkowitz, David Lefkowitz, and find out that there's a cantor in a synagogue in New York who has my name, no relation, and that there's um, another David Lefkowitz who's either a producer or, or a bass player in a band. He does music stuff. And he's not me either. So, but if you Google my name, there they are. And I know that there's a there was an attorney general named Louis Lefkowitz, who is no relation that I know of, and probably the, still the best known Lefkowitz that there is. But there are others out there, and found one by accident when I got a press release about a performance artist, a, mon- a monologist, kind of like a Spalding Gray, Mike Daisy type, who, um, who's out there making a name for himself, doing some one-man shows. And his name is Josh Lefkowitz. And I just couldn't, it's not like my name is Joe Smith. Uh, it's not like my name is even, uh, you know, Terry Cohen. I mean, Lefkowitz, it's, how, it's a name that you remember. You remember the, the, the TV sitcom Soap because of Elaine Lefkowitz. And, and I think they even used the name in one of the Larry David shows. So anyway, I'm Dave Lefkowitz. I've got on the phone Josh Lefkowitz, assumedly no relation. I'm going to talk to him about who he is. Hello, Josh. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> good, I'm good. A little bit of a long intro there, but uh, so so let's let's start off with what you do and what you're currently working on. Uh, sure, I'm a, I'm both an actor and a writer, and uh, maybe about four or five years ago, I um, combined the two interests in the form of uh, of a monologue, of an autobiographical monologue. And yes, the the folks you grouped me with, I'd say that's pretty accurate grouping: Spalding Gray and Mike Stacey. And um, I wrote these, um, you know, wrote my first full-length autobiographical monologue. It was called Help Wanted, A Personal Search for Meaningful Employment at the Start of the 21st Century. <laughs> Good luck, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much exactly what it sounds like. And uh, just sort of a narrative tale uh, talking about the experiences of graduating with, uh, you know, a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree and sort of finding one's way in the world. And, um, and mm-hmm. then so was able to generate a little bit of... Um, get heat is what they call it or success or interest from that and um, was recently commissioned by a theater down in Washington D.C. a Woolly Mammoth Theater Company oh yeah, uh, yeah. they're pretty well known oh yeah yeah I feel real lucky to have known them they, they ended up presenting the first piece Help Wanted and it got some you know got r- really favorable reviews about which I was very happy and, and this, so that it, I assume concerned your work in the, in the normal, in the non-creative, non-performing arts job market. So, oh, including such things as? Oh, parking attendant in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, all the standard stereotypes, waiter, temp, a, you know, temp agency, mail clerk, uh, executive secretary to the receptionist of the office department of the, you know, user support data analyst, you name it, all that. How do you get so many short-term jobs? Were they part-time to begin with, or did you just get fired after a couple of weeks? (laughs) Well, I wasn't the best employee. I think (laughs) lurking in all of those experiences was always this need to, uh, you know, find a way to get back to the creative work, but um, I think it was also a combination of just hungry for experiences. I mean, there's one part in the show, and I quite literally say, I'm I'm thinking to myself, you know, what would Spalding do? And I'm thinking about Spalding Gray quite literally aloud in the show. I'm thinking about this you know, my last great hero, this this, this you know, artist who had turned the material of his life into this incredible work. And so yeah, I think at one point, the point in this story, the temp agency is calling up. They're saying NASA's on the phone. NASA, I'm thinking, oh, my God, do you want me to launch a spaceship? Is that why they're calling? And they're like, not exactly. They want you to dress up in a spacesuit and take pictures with a bunch of little kids. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at the University of Michigan. It's, I don't do that. And then I think to myself, you know, what would Spalding do? And I think, well, he probably would take the job just because it would be such a wacky experience to have. And uh, but then I end up doing that, and I think that sort of, was my guiding impetus those first couple of years right out of school. Well, first of all, it's a, a job's a job. 
and it puts money on the table. Uh, right. Well, money, food in the fridge, money on the table, or how, whatever the metaphor is there. And, as you said, it becomes fodder. Uh, where would we be had um, David Sedaris not worked at, for Macy's for a couple of weeks? Exactly. And then come out Great with, example. Yeah, the Santa Land Diaries. I mean, you, you, that's where it all comes from. One of the, the blocks that I sometimes have as a writer is the fact that, you know, I sit there and write and I do my stuff and I do this radio show and I, I do, I'm working on a TV thing that I'm directing locally and, and the stuff, and it's all feeds on itself. It's like this cycle and there isn't that much outside of it to talk about or report on. I have to jump into the newspaper when I get on the radio because I haven't had so many life experiences during the week that I can tell people that, that were particularly interesting. I just thought yeah, I'd mention. <laughs> yeah, I think that's totally accurate. And, yeah, it certainly, you know, makes for, uh, you know, the more wacky, wild, dramatic, high-low experiences there are. I mean, the, the material ends up being all the better for it. And that, that sort of actually ends up playing into uh, what the new piece is about, the one that Willie Mammoth commissioned. The, the, the title of it is called Now What? And it's, I guess you could say it's sort of a sequel, though I think it ends up living okay on its own. There were quite a number of people that saw it. I just was doing it down there in D.C. this fall, and um, there were people that saw it that had not been exposed mm-hmm. to Help Wanted. And I tried to do a nice little quick recap early on in the show just to catch everyone up to speed. But uh, it's sort of about, okay, you, this is, you've declared yourself as an autobiographical monologist, or, uh, among other things. And so... Now you will do this. You will end up writing about the events of your day. And so now the mantra that's kind of going in my head throughout the, the narrative of the piece is maybe you should write about this. Maybe you should write about this. And someone will say something or do something, and I'll think maybe you should write about this. And uh, the, it comes to a sort of a dramatic peak, a climax, if you will, um, about three-quarters of the way through the show when uh, my girlfriend and I are sort of going through a difficult uh, period of, Issues of, you know, pretty standard to, I think, any long-term relationship and long-distance relationship with that. Mm-hmm. And even now, the voice is really picking up its speed and momentum and volume, as it says, maybe you should write about this, maybe you should write about this, <laughs> and it comes to a head when, uh, you know, <laughs> the person whom I'm writing about, you know, just starts to wonder, you know, what what's the cost of this work going to be? You're not dating Renee Shafransky, are you? A, I'm sorry, what? You're not dating Renee Shafransky, are you? No, 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 no. Great joke there. No, but um, so so what is like one of the key um, comical, let's hopefully go for anecdotes of now what the the piece that you're working on now? Sure. Well, I, I guess one of the lighter moments comes with. I mean, you know, the question of now what extends not just to the you know the quality of the work, but also the quality of life. I mean, now I've been with this same girlfriend her name is Annika and she's a primary figure and all all the things I end up writing and performing and you know we've been together for a really long time and one night we're just lying in bed in Brooklyn and she says she says you know you I just really want to let you know that sometimes you can be very selfish I was sick all weekend and I had a sore throat and you know my nose was clogged up and you didn't do anything to take care of me and I, I just couldn't help but think I mean if this is what it's like when I'm sick just like this just sick on a regular basis <laughs> I mean what would it be like if I were pregnant that's what I want to know because oh, it boy. feels like you wouldn't be there for me because you're not there for me now and so then in my mind and then aloud to the audience I start thinking about oh god oh no <laughs> not the idea of these kids I mean here I want to be this artist this great you know downtown or in this case Brooklyn avant-garde performing artist and now I've got these imaginary kids sitting on my lap and the kids are like feed me clothe me take me to swimming lessons and I'm like quiet Josh Jr. quiet Josh Gina. I don't have time for you Josh I'm, Gina. I'm an artist <laughs> I'm like that Josh Gina. that's very yeah. good how old are you, by the way? Oh, uh, right now I'm 26. Oh, so ye- until you're 29, you don't have to listen to any of that biological clock crap. I'm so, <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm 43. I'm listening to it loud and clear. But you've got, you know, you got time, dude. I don't care how long you two have been together. <laughs> yeah, it's just speculation. You know how it is. Every time the phone rings and a friend from back home says, "I'm getting married" or "I'm having a baby," you just think, "Oh my god!" Uh, please, oh my, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, man. I am so with you. Are you were you born in Michigan, or where uh, are you yeah, from? Yeah, suburbs, suburbs of Detroit, uh, West Bloomfield, Michigan. I grew up there, and uh, went to school in Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan, and then lived in Washington D.C. for a couple years. It just sort of with this fluke incident, a uh, professor, you know, offered me an opportunity to audition for a, a play, um, and I was able to do it. And then 
moved subsequently up to New York and now live in uh, Park Slope in Brooklyn. Oh, very cool. cool. Which is also, you know, plays in, in now uh, the idea of, like, all of these yeah, worries and woes about kids, and then you walk the streets of Park Slope, and everyone is trendy with their coffee mug in one hand and their baby stroller in the other, and babies, babies everywhere. And, and Tallis's, too, <laughs> I should imagine. <laughs> Hi, this is Josh Lefkowitz, the monologist, and you're listening to Days Gone By at WGBB. And if you're not listening, then how are you hearing this? We're talking with Josh Lefkowitz. No relation, as far as I know. That's also what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, A, were you raised semi-religious, conservative, not even religious at all? And B, who are your parents? I'm curious. Sure. Um, My parents are uh, Paul and Janice. And I'll go back one generation, two more I can do, because I figured we would come to this day. I yeah, figured of course. Right, we were t- talking about it. Um, my grandparents are um, Janet. Uh, wait, no, that's my mother, Janet. So Nobody has grandparents, grandparents named Janet. No Jews have grandparents named Janet back, back, back then. <laughs> the grandparents are uh, Ruth and Julian. And uh, Julian's father was uh, Ben. Ben came over uh, from Russia, I believe, unless I wasn't paying attention correctly. If, uh, do you know what going. part of, was it like Russian Poland or, or where? Uh, I, I don't even know. I should have looked into this, but I, I never did. Uh, hmm. And then the other side, like the other side of the family. The other side is Blau is the name, and uh, the grandparents are uh, Edward uh, and uh, Eddie and Florence. Eddie and Florence. I'm not and beyond uh, that. I can't do. Okay. Mm, okay. I'm not getting any kind of read on that. I mean, I'm, I, my parents are Brenda and Philip on the left side, going into like. Ever heard of the Rosemarin clan? Uh, no, no. Oh, no. Like, I guess we're in, I mean, who, who the heck knows? It could be fourth generation, fourth cousins, ten times removed. With, and, and, and still be, like, from adjoining towns in Russia. And still not really know it, the way these things <laughs> work out, you I guess, know? I still feel the, the kinship, for sure. Well, cool. Well, yeah, but you know how it is when you have a name like this. You kind of right. think... Louis Lefkowitz, maybe, maybe. Uh, do you know any other Josh Lefkowitzes? Have you ever heard your name before in full? Well, a lot of times I have a Google alert set up, and so, you know, I'll get emails about it. And apparently there's a Josh Lefkowitz who um, is very good at tennis, or at least was on the Ooh. collegiate level, NCAA. He often won a lot of championships, or maybe is still winning them. I don't know if he's still in school. A Jew uh, good in sports. Oh, my God. Okay. I know. I thought that, every time I get that, I'm like, no, no, no. That's Quincy. not this Josh Lefkowitz. Uh, <laughs> And then there's another Josh Lefkowitz that um, I think he wrote some uh, terror reports analysis for um, at least one time it was the Village Voice. And I know this because my friend uh, emailed me and uh, said, how wonderful that you would write this. What a great contribution this is to the world at large or something along those lines. And I had to unfortunately write her back and say, no, 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 that's not me. I'm the Josh Lefkowitz that writes about himself, himself, nothing but himself. Yeah, that's no, no, more no. like me, totally. Yeah, the, the hell with the world. <laughs> that's, you know, it's about us. That's, that's right. the main point. Hi, this is Josh Lefkowitz, the writer and performer. And though I'm not related to Dave Lefkowitz, I wish I were. You're listening to Dave Gone By at WGBB. I'm talking with Josh Lefkowitz, the performer, monologist, the uh, the author and cast soul cast member of Help Wanted, a personal search for meaningful employment at the start of the 21st century, and his newest performance piece, Now What, which was recently done in Washington, D.C. When are you going to be doing it in New York? That is a good question. Um, I was able to do a couple of readings downtown. Uh, Dixon Place is a space down and right just by Bowery, uh, mm-hmm. or on Bowery in Houston, and that was nice. I'd like to do a longer run, but um, the question is, you know, always with New York, it's about timing and um, you know, right. the right space at the right time, being able to uh, make it so that the maximum amount of, you know, people can know about it and will be able to attend. And there, there are people that work on this that are bigger and more knowledgeable about, about it than I am, so... Um, all I know for now is it's going to Baltimore Center Stage. It's a great theater there, and they've they've been big fans and big, very just very kind to me over the years, and really helped me with Help Wanted. They helped me get their dramaturgs and literary staff, helped me put the thing together, and always offering feedback and advice. And they presented Help Wanted last January, and now have just said, I mean, it was so cool. They heard about Woolly Mammoth down in D.C. commissioning the new piece, and they pretty much said they were just like you know we're interested in this and we we let's try to make it work because we'd love to have you come back and we were able to do it so it'll be this January the second to the twentieth in Baltimore and 
just a gorgeous theater, and I just they're really kind to me there. And uh, cool. I, always, I eat like three crab cakes a week when I'm there. I just <gasps> spend so much. That's so not kosher, man. <laughs> I'm in my I know. Well, <laughs> but but um, you studied apparently with or under uh, Eric Bogosian. Yes, he's been a uh, mentor for uh, a couple of years now, a few years. Um, right out of school, that I I'd heard about this. Um, residency down in Florida. It was like one of those arts residencies. This one was the Atlantic Center for the Arts. Uh-huh. And they always have uh, different master artists coming in. I think they do it four times a year, three different master artists each time and a, a variety of mediums and teaching ten what they call associate artists, which are really people that they pick from a pool of applicants to come and you know work for three weeks in blissful Florida with these sunny walkways and palm trees overhead and your food is prepared for you and it's <laughs> really quite a wonderful experience. Uh, and uh, so, yes, Eric Bogosian was a, the master artist down there, one of the three. Uh, it was in October of 2003, and I applied, and uh, apparently everyone else ended up meeting with him and doing interviews in New York. I, I was still in Michigan at the time, had just finished up school, so I just sent in this crazy audition video. I just videotaped myself doing some ridiculous character that I had written, and uh, it hit the spot for him. It was a wonderful experience, and he you know, except me, and I went down and, and trained with him and uh, learned under him, got to work on a new play that he had been writing, and he sort of gave some feedback about the solo work and just about the life of an artist in general. I mean... Well, I was so really he was very helpful. Of, he, oh, he was, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, what's something that specifically that he taught you? Oh, that's, I know. Huh. Um, let's see. I mean... Is there anything you can put your finger on, like, um, you know, or, or maybe just an overall yeah. sense that you got from him? Well, the, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me that question is, it wasn't even down at the residency, but it was just something recently. I went to this event that he, they were honoring him at PS122, uh, you know, the same performance based sure. downtown, and they did a whole fancy uh, auction night, uh, and he was sort of the centerpiece of that night. And I, you know, said hey to him, and congrats on, you know, Law and Order and CI and all that um, awesome stuff that he's all in the play on Broadway and off Broadway, and, just, you know, he had such a great lovely, I don't want to call it a renaissance, but he really did get, you know, all this great stuff started sure. happening, picking up speed again, and I guess the secret there is to just keep making the work, and you come around, and it comes around, and it goes around, but anyway, the point is I w- went up to him, and at this point, I was really struggling with the content of now what, and I didn't know to what degree I should um, uh, bear myself, or put it all in the show, and so I sort of asked him about that, or just real quickly, I mean, everyone was crowding around trying to get to him, and I was like, hey, do you remember me? And he was like, yeah, of course. He was really kind. Yeah, yeah, of course I remember you. Yes, I love Josh. How's it going? And I said, I'm really struggling with this piece. I'm working on the new solo, and how do I, you know, I'm not sure how much to put in. And I, he basically said, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember, but he was like, just put it all in there, and, we'll, you know, you can worry about the rest of it later, but just hmm. put it all in there. And uh, it was an awesome piece of advice, and I totally adhered. It was like exactly what I needed to hear at that one moment, and I totally adhered to the advice completely. Well, um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you as, as sort of a fellow writer and toiler in some level of creative endeavor is how do, you, how do you schedule your writing and work time, balancing it with your making money time and your all the stuff you have to do to live and get your name and your work out there? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would, could ask the same for you. I, I mean, the rate. I mean, I don't know what the radio show ends up picking up in terms of time, or has it become? Um, I don't know. But I guess everyone's sort of piecing together puzzle is different. But for me, I have to do the writing in the morning because otherwise it just looms like a rain cloud for the rest of the day, mm-hmm. and uh, I just can't. I don't like to work like that. So if I can get in three hours in the morning, nice. um, I can. I'm pretty happy after that, and. And then for getting the word out, I mean, you know, I always get this piece of advice from my aunt. She's a painter out in Oakland, California, and she she reserves all of that stuff for Sunday. But she's so in love with the process, and I feel like she's just a mature artist, more mature than I am, because I still feel a little young and a little antsy, and I really want to, like, you know, make make sure that people know about things and, you know, get the business side crackling and make sure that things are happening and always more opportunities, more chance for, you know, work to get presented and fame and awards and stardom and I own the country, that sort of thing. And I get, re- I, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, I get too swept up in that and all of a sudden I forget about what's yeah. really important, which is, of course, not the product that they end, but the process of making the work. And 
I'm trying to work on that, but I don't know. I spend a lot of the afternoon on the email doing that whole thing. Facebook, MySpace, going on YouTube, all the wasting all oh, that yeah. time. And well, that. do you have an agent at this point? Uh, yes, cool. my uh, literary agent and uh, and an acting agent pretty much as well. Um, it, it, so, yeah, I'm lucky. I feel, you know, fortunate to, to have those people working for me. So, you've, as an actor, you've appeared in other people's stuff as well. Mm-hmm. That was what my training was in. Um, I, I guess my Bachelor of Arts degree is in acting, but then I took a lot of writing courses as well. But, the, um, yeah, that's how, for the first couple of years out of school, I was pretty much, um, you know, acting traditionally in plays and, and whatnot. And then the writing started to pick up. And, and even still, I try to, I like to do, if it was up to me, I would do at least one project a year that would be just, you know, straight up acting. I think it's healthy, to be honest, because... When I get too lost in the solo world, it's, first of all, it's terribly lonely because there's no cast members to hang out with, and I don't even, you know, work with a director currently, so it's really just right. me just doing yeah. the thing, and it's a lot more fun when there's other people. Mm-hmm. You know, they say theater is collaborative, and when I get lost in the solo world, I think, what are you doing? Wouldn't this be so much more fun to have other people to hang out with? Um, but then, of course, I think it, feels, it helps the process because then you walk out on stage and you're just so desirous to connect to the audience and it really, I think it helps, it fuels the performance and the ability of just like the artist to say, I need you to listen to what I'm telling you because I'm so very lonely backstage. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you, um, are you like Spalding Gray in that you have the notebook and, and the script in front of you or do you memorize and, and or kind of have cues and that's it? Uh, with the first one, I had the pages actually on stage, and I would turn the pages as I went through the piece, uh, glancing at them from time to time. And it was more of an homage piece to Spalding because, as I think I've already mentioned, I mean, he, he was he was a big part right. of the piece. I mean, my adoration for him, and I was able to meet him right, you know, just a few weeks before, um, you know, he, uh, right. just, you know, he. Oh, re- I mean, you met him after the accident and stuff, and you. Yeah, uh, just right, right in uh, December of, um, I guess, December of. Oh, three. If I'm getting my dates right, or maybe December. Oh, yeah, I think December oh, three, and then in January oh, four was I think when he, uh, you know. Was he out of it? Was he cordial? Yeah. Or? No. When well, you um, met him. Yeah, I mean, I talk about it a lot in the show and help on it, but it was a really, you know, on the one hand, there was no way he could live up to my expectation of him because nobody would be able to live up to the, you know, this is yeah. also the piece is so much about hero worship and. There's just no way anyone could ever, you know, live up to well, how we think this person, this godlike, you know, artist or athlete or movie star or whatever, whoever it is we look up to, would be able to um, live up to those expectations. But even more so, I think in in the case of Spalding Gray, I think he was really, you know, getting worse and worse all the time as you know spring turned to summer and fall that year. And so yeah. I think, uh, it was, no, it was it was. It was a sad moment, definitely. But, but, but when you met him, it was sad, but it, it wasn't terrible. I mean, he wasn't completely... Well, no, what, what was it like meeting him? Uh, very brief. Uh-huh. Uh, I saw him do a reading of Life Interrupted, which was his last right. show that he was working on. And um, it was in the, you know, in the winter, fall, late fall into winter of um, that year. And, and it was at PS 122. And I was so excited to be there and you know, finally get to see him perform. And... Uh, you know, the performance was n- certainly not what I had hoped it would be. But again, I'm not sure that it could have been even had right. it been flawless. Um, but it was not. And, and I just was waiting at the stage door. I was so nervous, just uh, so excited to tell this guy how much, how inspired I had been and motivated to make work just like him. And I mean, I'm sure I was one of hundreds right. and hundreds over the years to, you know, want to convey this to, you know, a visionary artist like that. And I just was you know, waited at the stage door and he came out and I was just like, I'm Josh Lefkowitz and you are my last great hero. And huh. he said, you know, thanks. And then oh. shut the door and that was it. And, oh. so. didn't, and it didn't save his life, unfortunately. He didn't look at you like in a Hallmark commercial or something and go, <laughs> oh, I have reason to, to go on now. You know, I thought I was doing this for nothing and I thought uh, everything was going bad and I just want to drown myself. But, you know, this this young fella... He he was inspired by me, and now he's making art. I'm gonna, you know, it's like I just saw the end of it's a wonderful life, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah, it didn't happen that way. But it's been a wonderful chat and conversation with Josh Lefkowitz, the monologist and performer. How do we keep him? You say you have a MySpace page and a web page. How do people keep in touch or or find out where you're playing and what you're doing? 
Yeah, a lot of stuff on MySpace. Um, I haven't. I don't know why I haven't set up a website yet. I mean, I even had friends like that are like, "I'll design it for you." I'm, you know, but I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm still a little fearful of tattooing the World Wide Web with a slice of me. But I, I should get over that fear. But for now, it's yeah. MySpace is a good way. Facebook, all of those internet sites that I, you know, grudgingly end up spending hours and hours on on time. That's, that's so the best way to get a hold. Should they Google your name and that's how they'll get? Or do you have a, a URL or what? For, oh, for the MySpace. Yeah, you could, yeah, probably. I think it's just my, W. Oh, well, I don't think I know it. It's so yeah. MySpace.com and the backslash uh, Josh Leskowitz. Probably actually, well, probably a forward slash rather than a backslash. Oh, right. oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're here to <laughs> exactly. even know that. <laughs> That's about as technical as I can get. But yeah, I, it's probably a forward <laughs> thingy. <laughs> Thingy being the operative term. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I want to thank Josh Lefkowitz. No relation, but uh, certainly, you, you, you are now family because you're in the neighborhood. Now that you've been on the show, now you are technically part of the extended family of uh, Dave's Gone By and the neighborhood. So uh, I want to thank Josh Lefkowitz so much for, for sharing with us and keeping us posted. And, and do me a favor, let me know, obviously, when you're back and when you're going to be doing Now What in New York. And, and uh, you know, we'll talk some more. I would love that. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks for, yeah, that's, that's, I'll definitely do that. Thank you so much.